Hello and welcome to the Bulletin with UBS on Monocle 24. Each week we hear from the sharpest minds and freshest thinkers in the world of finance, taking you beyond the numbers and the hype and getting to the heart of the big issues of the day. Now, if you're a regular listener to this show, you'll be well aware that UBS is interested in addressing the big questions that shape our world. To help best answer them, they sought out a number of Nobel laureates in the economic sciences to ask them to share insights, discuss their research and open their always inquiring minds. This week, in the second in an occasional series of Nobel Perspectives, we're hearing from another such inspirational figure, Sir Christopher Pizzeridis, Regis Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics, where he spent almost all of his career. He's recipient of the 2010 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. On the agenda today, the origin story of his fascination with labour markets, search frictions and unemployment, a powerful exposition on the value of human capital, and a restatement of his belief in the importance of lifelong learning. And I'm delighted to say that Sir Christopher joins me now. Um, Let's start at the beginning, Chris. I know you've talked before about the influence that being uh, born in Cyprus has had, some of your early memories, I guess, of things you saw, and the influences, I suppose, that those early days had on your your work and the way that you viewed the world. Do you think you have a, a unique insight that was driven by that, story where you were born the things that you witnessed early on did that shape i guess it's inevitable the, the, the man well, you are today well it's inevitable that um, your early experiences would uh, will shape the things you do later in life in my case there are two things that shaped the way that i've uh, thought about the world later in life one was seeing my father who left school at the age of 10 because his family couldn't afford to uh, keep all their children in the village and he went to the city i mean the, the city was nicosia of a hundred thousand people but it was the biggest in cyprus at the time and worked for an uncle then uh, started his own business and then did well enough and i could see uh, how hard work is uh, is rewarded how he approached education which he didn't have he would do evening classes And that definitely shaped the way that um, I was thinking uh, later when I was studying about the labor market and how it works and how people without education can get in, start their own business uh, and progress. But then at the same time, I went to um, school in Cyprus when there was a lot of disruption to our education. First, it was the independence movement against British colonial rule. Then it was the, uh, the internal a conflict with the uh, between the Greek and Turkish uh, communities and that definitely disrupted the education a lot and it also taught me something else which is that capital could be destroyed very easily and land could be lost very easily but human capital what you have is the most valuable thing that you have and it's not it's not destroyed uh, easily you can make use of it uh, to progress to go somewhere else and really that had a lot to do with me coming to Britain as well the, when I finished my studies, it, it was the worst period to be uh, in Cyprus. It was the Turkish invasion war, many missing people uh, of my age. And um, I decided to um, come here and pursue a career. By that time, I had the PhD to pursue a career in uh, at, at universities, do research and, until we could see what would be the best thing for me to do in future and I'm still waiting to see what would be the best thing for me to do in future. Uh, well, I think it's worked, it's worked out pretty well. Let's see, you're, you're a very, very modest man. Um, let's talk a bit about, you've already actually reflected a little in just in that first answer about this idea of the particular aspects of sort of markets that you, you've you looked at most notably. We look at sort of search theory and some of these interesting I don't know how to describe them to a lay listener, maybe sort of imbalances or this strange meeting where, for example, you can have unemployment, but there are jobs available. I I guess, is is that question something you quite quickly identified as being something that would be central to your to your life's work? Because it seems so, I I don't know, it seems it's like a crazy situation almost to, to the to the lay observer. Well, that's precisely what motivated me, in fact, when I was a student, because when I was a student, Unemployment was very little. When I started my studies, unemployment was very, very little. It was only about 2% and they were and people were getting into the labor market very quickly, finding jobs. And the way economists were thinking about it was that you have either unemployment or job vacancies, but not both, because if you have the job vacancies, workers will take them and um, un- unemployment would come down. But then later in my student career and um, 
especially when I was thinking to start a, a PhD, suddenly unemployment started going up. This was in the late 60s, early 70s. And there was a lot of writing about it in the economics literature, but nothing really that explained what was going on. In fact, people were pretty clueless, in fact, as to why unemployment would, would be going up. Uh, so rapidly, you know, from 2%, it went up to 5%, I mean, which is, you know, doubled or more than doubled. And then at the same time, there were job vacancies. So amongst the uh, politicians, there were people saying, well, why aren't workers taking these vacancies? They're available. There are jobs available. Why are they unemployed? And again, there were no answers. Some of them would say, oh, it's because, you know, they're lazy and they don't want them. Maybe they get enough income from uh, uh, welfare support and employment benefit. Others, others would say, oh, because of housing problems, they have to move house to get it and, and council housing is not easily available for the unemployed somewhere else. So I thought, you know, this is a problem that needs explanation and, and, and I started working on it. It's, um, I mean, to the layman, it, it might sound an, an easy enough problem, but it kind of contradicted everything we knew about the economics of unemployment up to that point. We just didn't know how to think about it. There was no framework in which we could put unemployment and job vacancies and think, except for some vague or short statements made in the past, most notably by William Beveridge in, his, in, in the book that set up the welfare state, in fact, in the 1940s. He mentioned something that um, later on people uh, drew in a diagram and called it the Beveridge curve and still called the Beveridge curve. But that has been absolutely central, explaining what Beveridge was saying, what Beveridge Kurt was saying, absolutely central to my research. Uh, and I guess there's something interesting here, which struck me at least, and I know you've spoken before about the kind of human element here, and there's a human connection. You've talked about people finding work and how that market operates as being almost more, or having things in common with, say, other human relationships, which are explicitly emotional and not at all economic in character. Is that one of the things perhaps which made other economists before you less receptive to looking at this this space because those kinds of things are quite uh, understandably more difficult to, to quantify. Mm -hmm. They're not just ones and zeros. There's mm -hmm. a bit of a kind of a, a, an X factor about it. Well, I mean, precisely that because if you think if you think about unemployment, a person suffering unemployment is, the, it, it is one of the two or three worst things that could happen to them. There is... Uh, there is death of someone very close to you, divorce, uh, usually, not always, and um, unemployment. Those are the three big uh, shocks, if you like, in your life that will make you very unhappy. And yet, as an economist, you have to step back and look at it in a cold-blooded way, in, in, in a kind of mathematician's way. You know, you, you want to write down some equations, some numbers uh, and symbols that will tell you what's going on. But at the same time, you have to acknowledge that it's something that involves the emotions of someone. It, it involves decision making in very difficult times. There are many pressures on the person who is unemployed. You might say, am I not wanted? Am I not capable of doing anything? Am I running out of money? And combining those two it was the most difficult thing to do in um, both in my research and, and when others were working on uh, unemployment. The way economics evolved, it, it started off by descriptions of what people do and then became a little bit too abstract where, where the human element was missing entirely. I mean, Keynes was probably the last economist in 1936 who tried to bring it in by saying there's, there are psychological laws of how, many, how people behave. But after that, people reduced it into um, what he himself called the, the pretty diagrams or pretty symbols of, uh, of theoretical economics. And that's what, that's what I tried to do, really. I tried to bring in what I consider to be the important factors that people look at when um, they lose their job and, and they're trying to find another one. And the factors that they look at when they are in a job that they're not very happy with. And they're trying to study the market, if you like, and consider moving out. And, and the essence of economic modeling is that, is that you have to strip it down to its essentials so that you can write it in a simple model that statisticians or econometricians can put numbers to it and tell you whether it's significant in uh, today's uh, environment, market environment, or, or whether it's not. And I can see and we can hear this fascination with 
the human side of it, trying to incorporate that into the modeling. And you even began by talking about your father, this, this amazing sense of the transformational power of work and of what that can do for people. If we come a, a little bit more up to date, Chris, how is that transformational power changed or how is it evolving when we consider new technologies? Because this is something I know you've also written about and you talk about frequently. People talk about AI and robotics and all the rest of it. The pace of change seems to be faster than at any time over the last 40 or 50 years. Now, that may not be true. Um, but how, how is technology shaping that transformational power? Is it is it changing what it is fundamentally or does that stay the same? Well, technology, of course, is, is changing work all the time, uh, sometimes faster, sometimes n not so fast. But if we look back at the beginning of industrialization, which started in Britain late 18th century, then you have still gradual changes in the world of world in technology taking place and then suddenly a big shock arrives that changes everything you know the big shocks in the, in the past were uh, the railways the steam engine before electricity i think was the biggest shock of all actually in my view even even more than robotics and now we have more and more automation digital platforms uh, for trade robots doing the work that human beings were doing. The pace is faster now, but another feature of what we have now is that we have machines basically that can do a job better than human beings can do. It's, it's a thinking job, not a manual job where you, you know, obviously an electric drill can drill a hole in the wall much better than a human being can do without any use of electricity. But that's a kind of manual job and we can see why you need more power than what, than the muscle power that we have. But now there seem to be uh, tasks that require more brain power, if you like, than what we have. And, and, and they're provided by machines. And that's what's making people panic that, that you know, I studied at university, I've been doing, I can do my job very well and then suddenly my employer or another company comes along that uses artificial intelligence and, and big data and comes up with better answers than I do. So what do I do? You know, that's the threat that people are, are facing now. I'm generally positive about the outcome of um, these new technologies, but there, but, but there will be transformations in the labor market and, and they will be big. And we have to be prepared to accept those to see how we can make best use of them and how to move on to different types of jobs within the next 20 to 30 years. You talked earlier about uh, still learning, still being hungry to add to your knowledge, mm -hmm. learning in a, in a great seat of learning where you work uh, from day to day, of course. What about inspiration? Do you Is that where your inspiration comes from or do you sometimes need to check out altogether? Do you go for a wander, I don't know, near your home up in leafy North London, take a stroll, I don't know, Hampstead Heath, look out across mm. the city. How, how do you sort of give your mind a, a, a break and get some fresh mm. inspiration? What does what does that time look like? I, for... I, 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 I do that actually, funnily enough, sort of seeing the changes that are taking place in my local labour market because... I mean, as you know, London is so big that there are small markets and communities here and there. I mean, I do enjoy walking down my high street and uh, seeing what new shops there are, what, what people are buying, how they are buying, you know, how much uh, is being delivered in brown boxes with uh, a word beginning with an A, most of them <laughs> written on the box. Recently, though, most of my inspiration comes from um, traveling abroad in sort of different ways. You know, I, I mean, obviously, most of the inspiration and... Um, and the sort of the eye opener is going to China and seeing how that country is uh, transforming itself. Before this uh, big uh, Chinese takeoff and growth, if you asked an economist, they would probably have said, oh, you know, you cannot have growth without a liberal democracy and openness and transparency and open market. Well, they don't have it and, and they're growing very fast and, and very soon they're going to overtake the United States as the biggest economy because of their population, but they will still have the size. And I think that part of the reason that the response of the United States to what they see in China is uh, confused and contradictory, depending on who is in charge and what they think about it. And, and it's not good for the world, actually, either, but that's an aside in a way. So that's one. But then I also get inspiration when I go to uh, countries like Denmark, for example, and I walk in there because I, I was there recently 
um, walking their uh, pedestrian ways and seeing how clean the environment is, what they're doing, uh, how different they're doing it uh, from us. Because I always admire uh, the Scandinavian countries, the, the way that they run their social programs and their employment and their health and care and so on. And, and seeing the sort of, you know, I call it, I call it the post-industrialization phase in that what you care more about in those um, countries and, and what we should be doing more in our countries is not be obsessed with rates of growth, with the number, is it 1%, is it 2%, whatever, but be more concerned about the quality of growth and the quality of life in terms of the of the environment, of the, of the working environment, of the physical environment outside, in terms of the provision of uh, social services, fight against poverty. And it's one of the reasons, in fact, that I never felt very comfortable uh, being in the United States and thinking of settling in the United States when uh, all my colleagues that uh, achieved something in economics would go there because their universities are obviously very, very good. You know, go to Harvard, MIT, Stanford, whatever is, you're at the top. But I don't like just to be in the ivory tower provided in Cambridge, Massachusetts and not look outside and, and you do see poverty there, which I, I mean, I would feel so ashamed to see that on my doorstep, actually. Chris, it's been really wonderful speaking to you. I'm certainly glad speaking as a Londoner that you've stayed here for so long. Maybe as a final thought, do the same big fundamental questions. We kind of started by talking about what prompted you to mm. study, to move into this area of, of expertise, even as a, as a youth and the experience of watching your, your, your father as a young man and the rest of it. Do the same fundamental questions still preoccupy you now? I don't know. It's, it's funny. If you were starting out on your academic career now, do you think you would take a, a different course? I always find it interesting. You know, can reflect over what? Sort of 50 years of extraordinary yeah. research and writing and all the rest of it. Well, I'm sure I will go for the big question always because I think that's where you can make a real contribution. And and when I started my work on unemployment, that was the big question. Why is unemployment going up and why are we not understanding it? What are we going to do? Now that's not a, a, a problem so much. Unemployment is still there, but uh, we know how to deal with it. I don't want to take any credit for that, but many governments do use the various... Uh, models and various propositions that we developed in, in, in the work with, uh, with others and many, many others actually who uh, worked in this area of research. If I were looking at labor markets now and say, what is the big problem in labor markets? I would say in, in inequality because the way that technology is, is changing and the way the um, rates of return to capital and labor are moving, there is a shift towards capital and towards the owners of capital. Uh, digital capital, you can see you know, who are the wealthiest people on earth. And even in uh, countries like uh, China, where uh, as a less developed country, the wealthy people were the ones who owned land, or, or that the government made land available to them. But in the last 10 years, you have the um, internet entrepreneurs, you know, the Jack Ma's of this world, uh, overtaking them. So ownership of capital, of digital capital, brings in inequalities in the, in, in the labor market. You need to own capital to avoid the inequalities. But how can you make sure that workers benefit from that huge, enormous rate of return on capital when all they have is labor? And that's a very, very difficult question to, uh, to, to answer. And that's what 